All right, welcome everyone. This is Sarah Munson with Casey Family Programs, and we're so excited that you could all join us for today's webinar, Gearing Up for Family First. Today you're gonna to hear from some of our Casey leadership team regarding key elements and opportunities with Family First, as well as from some of our jurisdictional partners in Virginia and Iowa about their approaches to reducing congregate care and advancing prevention strategies. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know that we've muted your lines to reduce disruptions because we're going to be recording this webinar. But we encourage you to pose your questions throughout our time together in the Q&A on the Zoom platform. In order to do so, you can simply select the questions and answers button, type in your query, and hit send. Also, if you're just attending on the phone line, feel free to email your questions directly to us at kmresources at kc.org and we'll add them to our running list. We'll be collecting questions throughout today's session and do our best to answer them, either immediately or at the Q&A portion at the end. For those we're not able to get to today, we'll be providing answers in a follow-up document that we'll send out along with the recording. I hope you will join me in giving a really warm welcome to our presenters today. From Case. We have Christine Kalpin, who leads our public policy team, Juyun Chang, who leads our knowledge management team, Joan Smith, Managing Director of System Improvement Services, and we're so pleased to be joined by our jurisdictional partners as well, Carl Ayers, Director of the Division of Family Services at Virginia DSS and Wendy Rickman, Administrator of Adult and Children and Family Services at Iowa DHS. First, Christine, Joan, and Ju are gonna share some of the key opportunities to Family First, as well as how Casey can support these next steps. Christine? Thanks, Sarah. Um, the next slide talks a little bit about, um, just provides some background. They've asked that I start by talking about um, very high level of the key components of the Family First legislation. So um, the three areas that I'm gonna focus on are first, the new option the law creates for states and tribes to claim for funds for prevention activities as early as October 1st, 2019. The next will be um, the policy that really focuses on the placement options for states in order for them to be eligible for 4 reimbursement. Again, policy that can take effect as early as October 1, 2019. And the last area I'll touch on is the new funding um, and reauthorization of numerous funding programs that support prevention, court funding, as well as specific funding for regional partnership grants. So the next slide talks about the first area, which is the new funding that Family First will provide to states for prevention activities. This begins to provide resources for states to receive open-ended entitlement funding for evidence-based prevention services. So I'm gonna talk about who's eligible, for what categories, and for how long. So first, the category of um, individuals who would be eligible to receive these prevention services are children who the state would determine are at imminent risk of placement in foster care, as well as their parents or kinship caregivers. The law also specifies that pregnant and parenting youth in foster care are eligible. Unlike traditional 4E foster care, there's no income test for eligibility, so eligibility for these services is based on just the determination of imminent risk. And the law further defines that the states will get to determine who children are who are determined to be candidates for foster care. And the eligibility in terms of what the state um, is to look at is to determine who they believe are children who could remain safely at home or in a kinship placement with receipt of services or programs. So the next slide talks about what services are eligible for reimbursement. Um, the following evidence-based services would be eligible. First is the mental health prevention and treatment services for up to a 12-month period. The second are substance abuse prevention and treatment services for up to a 12-month period. And the third are in-home parent skill-based programs for up to a 12-month period. While each period is up to 12 months, there's no limit on how many times a child or their family could receive prevention services over their life. The next slide talks a little bit more about these prevention services. The law specifies they do need to meet an evidence base um, outlined as either promising, supported, or well-supported. 
there's a lot of language in Family First requiring the Secretary of HHS to really issue guidance on what these practices criteria will look like by October 1st, 2018. And in addition to the guidance, the Secretary is required to provide a pre-approved list of services and programs. They've already begun moving forward in this area. Um, just last week, the Children's Bureau released on June 22nd a Federal Road Register notice for comments um, asking for um, ideas around the initial criteria and programs for review that would be included in this clearinghouse with a 38-day period, so individuals are asked to comment by July 22nd. Um, in order to qualify and claim these dollars, states will have to submit a prevention and services program plan as part of the state's Title IV-E plan, and that plan would include a number of components specified in law, which include a description of how the state would administer the program, how the state would determine eligibility, train caseworkers, and other items. So the next slide talks a little bit about what the reimbursement rates will be. Beginning October 1, 2019 through September 30th, the reimbursement for these prevention services would be at the federal financial participation set at 50%. And then beginning on October 1, 2026, the federal financial participation or reimbursement rate becomes the state's FMAP rate. In order for the services um, to be reimbursed, the states will have to spend um, at least 50% of the spending in each fiscal year in the well-supported ca category of practices. And then the law also allows that in addition to reimbursement for prevention activities, states will be able to claim 4E reimbursement for both administrative costs as well as training costs at 50%. And as with the prevention services, the cost um, for admin and training under this plan would be delinked, so they would not be related to income eligibility of the child or the family. So the next slide just talks a little more about the availability of the funding. States and tribes are able to begin drawing down eligible prevention services on October 1, 2019. Um, there is language, however, requiring that these new federal funds for prevention services supplement and not supplant state funding, so they'd like to see this increase overall state child welfare spending on these services. And there's also language um, around a maintenance of effort, which says that states need to, um, that the maintenance of effort would be, would be based on what the fiscal year 2014 spending was for these same category of services for candidates for foster care. This last slide in terms of this section talks a little bit about um, the who is a candidate for foster care. And um, the main purpose of including this here is to be really clear that congressional intent around this language was not that the law would be um, very prescriptive and try to provide an exhaustive list of what it means to be a candidate, but rather that Congress and the members understood that there would be a lot of different scenarios in which states could be determined, or states could determine that a candidate was at risk for entry into foster care, and they really wanted the states to be in the driver's seat around that. So the next slide to turn to the second piece of this, which is the changes around um, what types of placement options would be eligible for reimbursement under 4E. Family First continues funding in the following four placement categories. So um, current law allows facilities for pregnant and parenting youth, supervised independent living for youth 18 years and older, as well as specialized placements for youth who are victims of or at risk of becoming victims of sex trafficking to be reimbursed. Um, current law also has always allowed reimbursement for foster family homes. The one change here is that Family First does define what it means to be a foster family home to say that there can be no more than six children in foster care in that home. There are some exceptions, however, to allow for large sibling groups, meaningful relationships, etc. So the next slide talks about sort of two of the new changes. The first is um, beginning October 1 of this year, so 2018, Title IV -E foster care maintenance payments will be eligible for reimbursement when they're made on behalf of a child in foster care who's placed with their parents in a licensed residential family-based treatment facility for up to 12 months. And as with the prevention services, there's no income test that applies for these services um, to be reimbursable. And then beginning as early as October 1st, 2019, after being in care for two weeks, Title IV-E federal support will be available for 4-E eligible youth who are placed in what's called a Qualified Residential Treatment Program. So the next slide talks about 
what we mean or what federal, what Family First defines as a qualified residential treatment program. Um, first, in, the first among the requirements included is that it would have a trauma informed treatment model, as well as registered or licensed nursing and other licensed clinical staff on site, consistent with what the treatment model outlines that the program would facilitate outreach and engagement of the child's family in the child's treatment plan, that it would provide discharge planning and family-based aftercare supports for at least six months, um, and the program has to be licensed accordance with state licensing standards and also accredited by um, one of the large accrediting bodies um, currently available. Um, we have, however, been pointing out there are no time limits on how long a child can be placed in a QRTP so long as the placement continues to meet their needs as determined in the assessment. This slide talks about the states do have the option to delay this provision for up to two years, but when they delay this provision, um, they also will need to delay then when they would begin drawing down funding under the prevention provision. And then in order to support state implementation of these um, placement changes, Family First does provide $8 million this year for HHS to to provide grants to states and tribes to support recruitment and retention of high quality foster families. So the next few slides just outline another, a couple of other additional select items included in Family First that we are um, listing up for states and tribes. The first is um, beginning October 1, 2018, 4E support will be available for evidence-based kinship navigator programs at 50%. HHS is also required by the law to identify model foster parent licensing standards um, with then language specifying the states will have to identify how or if they will implement them. And then there is also the requirement in Family First for states to develop a statewide plan to prevent child abuse and neglect fatalities. The next slide talks about provisions in the law to really promote timely permanency. The law provides $5 million in grants to states to expand the development of the electronic system currently in place that expedites these placements and requires that all states would use this electronic interstate system by October 2027. Um, the next slide outlines um, the reauthorization of the adoption and legal guardianship program through fiscal year 2022 that Family First included. The law did, however, delay the phase-in expansion of the Adoption Assistance D-Link for children under age two. So those children will now be eligible um, beginning June 30th, 2024 for um, full federal reimbursement. And then the last slide here on the law talks about um, a number of child welfare programs that were continued um, that provide stability and um, continuity in, in funding to states. Those include the Title IV-B programs and services, such as the Stephanie Tubbs-Jones Child Welfare Services Program, the Promoting Safe and Stable Families Program, the Court Improvement Program was reauthorized, um, and there was funding provided for regional partnership grants to increase well-being and help support children affected by heroin, opioids, or other substance abuse. Um, and the law also reauthorized and made a number of revisions to the John H. Chafee Foster Care Independence Program, um, with the, those revisions largely allowing states who have expanded foster care to the age of 21 to also expand um, services and funding for youth under Chafee up to the age of 23, as well as other changes that focused on um, bringing the language more into sort of focusing on transitions to adulthood. So Joan, do you want to talk about the next few slides? Sure. Uh, thanks, Christine. Um, um, so at, at Casey Family Programs, we believe strongly that um, the Family First Prevention Services Act is, is really is, one, is the most important new tool um, in a generation that we've had to be able to support safely reducing the need for foster care and improving the outcomes for our children and families across America. And we think that it's really an opportunity to utilize the tool along with the other um, tools that you have um, to create systems transformation. and, and really to view it as a way to advance your vision for what you want to see for the children and families in your community and not not just a, a funding and or, or revenue um, uh, opportunity that clearly comes with it but um, really are hoping that people utilize it to be that kind of transforming process that can really help our children and families even further than what we are able to do today um, and it, we've really felt it puts into um, action our values collectively as a field regarding 
the desire to strengthen families and, and prevent um, having them to come into care and uh, keeping them in intact families, um, um, using foster care only as the last intervention instead of the first, and ensuring that whenever possible, children are in the most family-like setting. And so to that end, um, and the next slide, we talk a little bit about what Casey want, hopes to offer um, all of you in being able to support you in, in moving forward under the new legislation and using the opportunities that um, Family First provides um, for uh, for all of the jurisdictions. And so as I think folks are probably aware, um, it, uh, Casey put together an effort to be able to support any jurisdictions that decided to take up the a 4 e wave demonstration project option that um, uh, came into play in 2012. And so we've been able to work with those jurisdictions uh, both in what they were planning for and then they, how they've gone about implementing anything that they were doing under those um, demonstration projects and are trying to capture all of the learnings from their experience up to this point and, and um, continuing forward as well as being able to bring forward any of the evaluation um, information that can help inform um, uh, services that could be available under Family First and beyond. And so we really want to build on that. We, we hopefully, we feel we've learned some things about uh, how to, uh, ways we can best support you. Um, certainly we don't know everything, but but trying to really learn from all that, make sure you are learning from what other jurisdictions actually experienced, but then also we're learning how to better support you as you um, uh, go down this path with Family First. And so um, wanting to use that as an opportunity. The second thing is, um, we feel like there's a lot of opportunity in the um, legislation for there to be um, uh, 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 guidance provided by the Children's Bureau and, and places where they're going to be able to um, have uh, um, uh, some way of uh, providing what, from the law to how we're going to implement. Uh, the, there's ways to influence that and we want to be able to create those opportunities for whether it's a senior leader caucus or uh, other ways we bring a collective jurisdiction voice um, to the table to to try and influence that to be as um, advantageous to states as possible to be able to move forward under the different pieces of the law. Um, we will continue to do webinars like this and other kinds of webinars um, um, to be able to bring information to you as soon as we can, as soon as we're aware of it, as soon as we learn anything to keep you informed of what anything that we can um, bring to the table that will be helpful to you. And we also want to continue to do our any kind of technical assistance that we can provide both in whether it's in groups to help you learn from each other and uh, other things like that, as well as individual technical assistance on individual issues um, that you bring through um, through your strategic consultants um, and anything that our partners, that our national partners that we work with on a regular basis can bring to bear, we wanna make sure that that's available to you. And to kind of kick that off um, after this webinar, one of the things that we will be doing is we have, hopefully you've heard of them already, um, uh, some upcoming regional um, uh, meetings that will have jurisdiction and tribal focus um, around this law and this implementation. And so um, the dates are there on the screen um, in July 9th in Seattle, August 1st in Denver, and August 16th in Atlanta. You'll have an opportunity to hear from, um, obviously, um, Casey Leadership, Dr. David Sanders and Mar uh, Marva Hammonds, as well as um, Jerry Milner from the Children's Bureau. Um, and an another a number of examples from um, states uh, on different aspects of the law and what they might be doing now to um, help uh, where you're thinking about where you want to go in your planning for um, being able to um, uh, implement the law and take advantage of the opportunities. So with that, I'm going to turn it to, uh, and if you haven't heard from it, talk to your consultant because I have the information for you to be able to register for those um, regional meetings. And you can have a, a team of up to five to come to those if you choose to do that. And so I'll turn it to June now to talk about um, some work on the intervention. Hi, sorry about that. I was muted. Yeah, I was trying to protect myself from speaking up before it was my time, so I double muted myself. Okay, apologies for that, folks. Um, so, uh, just wanted to say we look forward to seeing you all at one of these uh, regional convenings um, that's going on in the next uh, month and a half or so, but wanted to bring to your attention some um, urgent information that we hope um, you will weigh in. Um, as Christine um, and Joan talked about, there are lots of exciting new provisions in Family First. Um, one of the more exciting provisions is the opportunity for us to now use Title IV E as an open-ended entitlement program to pay for prevention services. Um, but as Christine pointed out, the law um, 
spelled out uh, the types of programs and level of evidence required for federal reimbursement. Um, and we believe that that is based on a desire from Congress to pay for things that work. Right. And I think we all agree um, that we want to invest both our federal, state and local dollars on programs that we know are most effective for children and families. However, in addition to the language that's included in the law that spells out in a great level of detail about what is included in evidence-based program, there is also an opportunity for all of you in the jurisdictions to weigh in and give feedback to the Children's Bureau um, as part of HHS who is responsible for issuing guidance about those um, evidence-based programs and which programs we will be funded, there's a chance for you to weigh in. And so we really hope that you take advantage um, of this period to weigh in. Um, the Federal Register Notice, as Christine pointed out, was issued on June 22nd. And all comments are due back to the Children's Bureau um, no later than July 22nd. And there is an email address there that's listed as well as a link to the Federal Register Notice that gives quite a bit of instruction about areas where they want your feedback and how to provide feedback. Um, having said that, we, when we met with the waiver jurisdictions, as Joan pointed out, that we meet with um, somewhat regularly, uh, the leaders from the waiver jurisdictions asked that Casey help them think about how to contribute to this conversation by identifying what research and evidence currently exists that might fit into those three categories of evidence-based programs. And so we have pulled together a compilation of uh, programs that, would, that we think would fit in those three areas of mental health, substance abuse prevention and treatment, as well as parenting skills, um, based on a review of a number of clearinghouses that identify evidence-based program in all three of those areas. Um, and we really want your feedback. Um, we want you to tell us what, if any, um, programs we missed, any modifications that we need to make, and want to emphasize that this is not designed to be a Casey product. It is supposed to be a tool that um, you all, if you need, is available for you so that you can raise a collective voice about the types of programs that you want to make sure are included um, in, in the, in the evidence-based programs that the Children's Bureau will include and or approve in your plans. And with that, I will turn it back to Sarah. Great. Thank you so much, Ju. Next, we're going to hear from Carl in Virginia about some of their strategies related to right-sizing congregate care and advancing prevention. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. I uh, hope you're having a wonderful day. Talk a little bit about the work we've done in Virginia and we'll take you back and talk a little history. This is not, uh, we did not get here overnight. So uh, here's some data that you're looking at right here. Uh, in Virginia, we have developed something called the Children's Services Act and I will talk with you a little more of those details as we go through this. But uh, we had an administrative action uh, back under the Governor Kane administration, and the First Lady had a major focus uh, coming in to reducing you know, the percent of children that are in group homes specifically. She was a juvenile court judge and saw a tremendous amount of this in her work. And so beginning in uh, late 2007 and moving forward from that end of it, we have had a significant child welfare system transformation and moving forward with uh, using community-based care services. What is really interesting as you look at these slides is not only did we make this uh, change, but we have been able to sustain this change over time. So the efforts were not just flash in the pan, one administration. Virginia has a four-year time-limited governor, so they cannot succeed themselves. So we have new administration that comes in every four years. And so you will see the significant drop in children in group care and in children in foster care. So even uh, with the most recent numbers is we, uh, between the ages of zero and 17, we have less than 4,800 children in foster care for a population of uh, about 8.3 million. So pretty, pretty significant uh, foster care population. As you look on the next slide as we're going through this, is uh, the cost is a huge driver around uh, where does the money go, how do you spend it, and what are you looking at? And so as you look through these slides, what you really see on the left 
is an upward trajectory in the amount of money that we are putting into serving children and primarily serving them outside of the home. Whenever we started this work, we had roughly one in every three children that were in foster care that were in a congregate care setting. And so this huge focus on moving towards community-based services uh, were, was significantly less costly. However, what it did is we did not see a subsequent decrease in foster care and then a subsequent increase in foster care whenever uh, there was no longer a huge focus on this. And so uh, just going back to 2001, following it through and then looking through the decline, and on the next slide, I will talk with you more about the uh, ongoing fiscal piece of this. But what you see is that if we would have continued on the path that we were at, we were going over half a billion dollars in expenditures that we were going to, and we immediately started moving backwards with those expenditures without a subsequent drop in the uh, type of care and the quality of care that our children and families were getting. Because we had a huge focus on community-based services and uh, understanding that foster care was really not the answer and that we weren't having the outcomes that we wanted to see in our system. <clears throat> and so as you look on the next slide, you will see the current spending that we are in the pool fund. And it's important for other states to understand that what we did in Virginia is we pull our major funding sources for children's services from the Department of Social Services, from the Department of Juvenile Justice, from the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, which handles all of our mental health services, and the Virginia Department of Health, seven different funding streams that we put under one uh, area called the Children's Services Act. And so what you will look at with those expenditures as you look at the Children's Services Act expenditures is you see that those expenditures, even as of today, going back to the previous slide, is that we are nowhere near where we were spending in the late uh, 2007, 2008 range. And our congregate care expenditures are basically flat while we continue to put additional money into our community-based services. And uh, in order to understand what community-based services are, those are services that have to be provided to the child and family in the community where they reside. So you cannot remove the child from the community, put them into a separate setting, into a separate home outside of the community, and then uh, consider that a community-based service. And so everything that we are doing is flowing in the direction of supporting those community-based services. So as we look at what the Children's Services Act is and was, it began in 1993, and I already told you about the seven funding streams that were put together. But interestingly, as being the child welfare administrator in the state, is I administer the Title IV-E funds through the department, but all the state foster care monies are included in this Children's Services Act. So basically, we have set up a system that works in collaboration with each other that looks at room and board and maintenance from the traditional 4E side and looks at services through the Children's Services Act. So there is a dual focus on not only housing in the appropriate housing manner, but also providing the most appropriate uh, services that are, that are in place. And a little understanding about Virginia, if you're not familiar with our geography, is we are, we are also one of the state supervised locally administered systems. So I have 120 local departments of social services that each have their uh, on unique structure and each have a director that oversees those uh, systems. So it's really important that we provide clear direction and clear oversight and clear vision in order to get the entire system moving in the correct uh, manner. So in addition to that, the Office of Children's Services required the development of a, of a local two different teams that have to be uh, set up in those localities. One is the Community Policy and Management Team, otherwise known as the CPMT. That is uh, the basic admin your administrators from each of your child serving agencies in that uh, jurisdiction. In addition to that, it created a Family Assessment and Planning Team, and it called the FAP. And the Family Assessment and Planning Team are more your direct line professionals that 
know the families, know the services, and help develop those individualized service plans for each of the children and families that we serve. And so as you continue to follow that process through, what we are doing is engaging the entire system in development of services and plans for our children and not just putting that on uh, the Department of Social Services. So we have taken a philosophical approach in the state that these are not social services children, but these are the Commonwealth's children. And it is up to us as each of the child serving agencies to come together and serve these children and serve them in the most appropriate manner. And so CSA uh, in and of itself serves about 15,000 children uh, statewide on an annual basis. If you look at the average statewide match rate, it is 65% state funds and 35% local funds. There are no federal funds that are included in our CSA. But a really important piece to understand is how we were able to uh, move this transition is that each jurisdiction had a base match rate. And that was established in 1993. And so there are 130 local community, uh, Children's Services Act entities. And whenever we made these changes in the uh, late 2008-2009 timeframe, is we then went from 130 individual match rates to 390 match rates. So imagine the fun of trying to administer uh, all those different match rates. But really, once you set the system up, it just follows along based on where the care is provided. But uh, so we went from the base match rate and we created something called an incentive match rate or a community based match rate. What this was, was this was half of what your local uh, base match rate was. So uh, just for instance, take uh, 20%. So if your local match rate was 80% state funds and 20% local funds, then if you use community based services, then you were then getting 90-10 money. So 90% state fund and 10% local funds. So you were saving 10 cents on every dollar just by going and using community-based matches services. In addition to that, we also instituted a higher match rate for congregate care or a disincentive match rate. So if you went with congregate care, then you paid a 25% higher uh, rate than you did for your base match rate. So using the 20%, then you would be paying 25 cents on every dollar instead of the 10% on the community-based match rate. So it significantly incentivized local agencies to move in that direction. Here is uh, just from, uh, so you can understand how the foster care population uh, it, in Virginia is similar to other states. You will see that we are more than 2,000 children uh, lower than any comparable state, just if you're looking at population within a couple million uh, population in the state of Virginia. So that focus on community-based care, you can really see whatever you start comparing it to uh, similar size uh, states. And so what did we learn from all this work? That a major focus has to be on serving children and families in the community-based setting. Uh, we had, it required support from the governor's office all the way down. This is not something that we would have been able to accomplish just from the Department of Social Services. It really required a team effort and a push to get the legislative changes, the match rate changes, those sort of things. Uh, we needed a shared understanding of trauma and the realization that foster care is not the answer. So we had continued to see the populations increase, but not see the subsequent outcomes. And so it was a big issue that you're not going to solve societal issues by removing children and placing them in the foster care. And so how do we do a better job of serving that population? And while CSA is unique to Virginia, we've created a system where all child serving agencies are at the table and they're required to be at the table. So uh, going back to what I already told you, these are Virginia's, the Commonwealth's children, these are not social services children or behavioral health children. They are really the Commonwealth's children. And the last piece of that, serving them with wraparound services to the child and the family and serving them in the least restrictive environment going, once again, not focusing on the foster care piece of it. And then just here are a couple of resources. <clears throat> Would encourage you to take a look at 
our annual statistics, we are uh, we post everything. We're very transparent, so take a look at it if you have questions. Let us know. But the back on track transforming our Virginia's child welfare system was uh, is a wonderful document that can help lay out specifically some of the blueprint for how we went about this and some of the changes that we made. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carl. Next, I'll invite Wendy Rickman from Iowa to share some of their jurisdiction's approaches and next steps. Wendy? Thanks so much. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Um, Iowa um, was put in a position of having to reprocure all of our out-of-home services for kids um, with the need to write RFPs and to have contracts in place by July 1st of 17. So actually we started a year to a year and a half before those RFPs came out, trying to grease the skids on taking advantage of the opportunity that presented itself related to really re-engineering the whole out of home placement kind of paradigm. Um, so a year, year and a half before these RFPs went out, we put together some shared values and principles, which you see here. Um, we started conversations with judges and juvenile court officers in Iowa. Um, all of our out-of-home services are shared services between our child welfare or China kids and our delinquent kids. So um, we had lots of conversations with the juvenile court officers involved on the delinquency side with legislators. And then specifically with providers, we surfaced this kind of set of shared values and principles, but we also purchased, the state purchased for our private providers some technical assistance. So we contracted with Susan Dreyfus's group to really come in and teach our providers about where we were headed, to give them some solid examples from a peer support perspective, but also a business model perspective to get things kind of set up the way we wanted them. So you can see on this first slide, <clears throat> just the shared values and principles. Uh, Iowa is a state that from end to end, either west to east or north to south, it's about a six hour drive. And we had a ton of kids who were placed six hours away from where they started. So obviously we wanted to keep kids closer to home. We wanted to keep more kids living with relatives and siblings, least restrictive setting. Um, we wanted to increase the number of foster families, but we wanted it to be foster families who were actually serving the mission that we were headed toward. Uh, we wanted to ensure that services were available in kids service areas. We messed around with our payment structure, which I'll talk a little bit more about. We wanted to make sure that people knew what was going on from a communication perspective to reduce some of our instability to start talking about exit planning from the first day of placement. And then we did some kind of fun things. <laughs> from the state side, they were fun things. From the provider side, I'm not so sure, but around pay, per for, pay for performance. And we'll talk a little bit about that too. So on the next slide, you'll see um, really our contractor capacity, just from a context perspective. We have, um, in 15, we had 13 contractors they had 15 shelters and in Iowa, it's not just shelter care. The reason it's called emergency services is that we do have a diversion and a shortening of shelter bed stay kind of component to that service. So we call it emergency services and shelters. You can see where we were with foster group care, supervised apartment living, and then our recruitment and retention of foster families or of resource families. So that's kind of where we were starting from a numbers perspective. We decided then to do some combining. So we created two RFPs out of all of those services. The first was crisis intervention, stabilization and reintegration, we call that scissor. So we put the emergency services and shelter together with the foster group care services together with a supervised department living into one RFP. And then we created, um, around the recruitment, retention, training, and support of foster parents or resource families. We previously had done that in two separate contracts. So 
So the first was more around training and peer support. And then the second was more around recruitment and retention. It didn't make any sense to us to have those uh, functions with two different entities. So we combined them. Um, moving on, you can see what we wanted to strengthen within the recruitment and retention contract. We had some trouble with matching. So um, it was creating a problem from a stability perspective. So we wanted to really look at matching. We wanted well-trained foster parents. And we'll talk about our foster parent situation a little bit more when I touch on where we're headed from a family first perspective. Um, in writing this RFP, as I said, we combined two former contracts into one. So we streamlined a lot of things from a ro role and responsibility perspective. We wanted to make sure that we were doing a better job with siblings, with older kids, with cultural kind of matching. Um, we took a specific look at kids who had really intense increased needs and trying to create a system where they did not have to go to institutions to be cared for. Um, the integration again and communication and then really trying to enhance some support for non-licensed relative caretaker. Um, we had a similar effort as it relates to the scissor contract. So um, again, trying to just align things in a better way. Um, I laid out for you some of the key decisions that we made. So from an RFP structure perspective, we've talked about how we've combined them. Pricing structure. Um, for our scissor contract, for the foster group care providers in particular, we had always paid for those services based on a child in a bed. So as long as a kid was in a bed, you'd get your daily payment. That resulted in our group care providers really not wanting to let kids go. Um, so we introduced the idea of guaranteed beds into that contract. That did a couple things. Um, it ensured that from a cash flow perspective, our group care providers would know where they were because we were gonna guarantee a certain level of bed with, or a number of beds with each of them. Um, it also made them less likely to try to hang on to kids because uh, it ensured that whether there was a child in the bed or not, they were gonna get the same payment. In kind of exchange for that though, we also introduced a no eject, no reject, part of our contract. So previously, we had a series of kids who would be referred to every one of our in-state facilities and they'd just flat out say no, or had total ability to take a kid who was struggling and just say, come pick them up. So we guaranteed a level of beds, but we also said you're expected to serve the kids that you are referred as long as that child is appropriate for a foster group care placement and you do not have the ability to reject them or eject them when they are struggling. Now, in all things, as you'd probably know, we did create a goat path exit ramp. <laughs> it was not a four lane highway exit ramp, however. So there, there were, we do have an ability for folks to say this child is just so out of control or so not matched our program that we need to do something different, but it is a goat path. It is not a paved road. We updated all of our performance measures um, and we'll talk about that a little bit in terms of um, tying incentives to their own contracts, but also intertwining incentives. So our providers across the service array are now much more dependent on each other's performance to be successful. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. We um, have five service areas in Iowa, and so along the lines of expecting that we wanted to have our kids place closer to home, we used to just do these contracts statewide during this procurement. We said we will procure these services in service areas. And the expectation is that if you live, for example, in the Des Moines service area, we should be able to provide services appropriate to the needs of Des Moines service area kids 95% of the time where they live. So I love some of the concepts that Virginia has talked about. 
in terms of both the investment that's been made at the local level, but the idea that these are not child welfare kids, these are Iowa kids, and trying to pull that much closer to home. Um, the next three, oh, um, let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that one for now, movement toward child welfare system of care. So flip to the next one. So this next slide really, the next series of slides, there are about three of them, are really just kind of pictorial views of one performance measure in these contracts. So you'll see that in fiscal year 16, the idea on these slides is that the more blue, the better, basically. So you see where we are in terms of kids who are placed in their county of origin in 2016. The next slide then, you see um, the percentage of kids placed in their county of origin from August 15th through November of 17, which is, again, our contract started July 1st of 17. Um, so we're getting a little bluer. Next one. This slide represents what, because of the way our service areas are situated, when we did our contracts, we counted placements within two counties of where the facility was. So when you look at kids placed within two counties of where they started in Iowa, obviously we're getting a lot bluer, which is the point. And then the next one really shows that evolution. So now the percentage of kids in Iowa that are placed three plus counties away are much, much, many, many fewer, which is exactly what we were trying to get to. Um, and just let me say briefly, Sarah, we pulled together this joint presentation, obviously. Sarah has both of the presentations that I use to pull slides from. She has the full presentation, so we'll make sure that we make that available to folks. That data set, for example, is just a very small piece of the data that we're sharing with our providers at this point. So we'll make both of those PowerPoints uh, around the procurements and the data that we're sharing available to folks. Um, from an overtime perspective then, you'll see kind of where we are from a, a family foster care perspective, a group foster care perspective, supervised apartment living and then shelter. <clears throat> um, our group care numbers are going down, foster family care going up. Our family centered service package, referrals to that package are going way up. Um, next then, in terms of the lessons learned, real quickly, this shift happened much more rapidly than we anticipated. So in the years previous to July 1st of 17, we were averaging about 650 kids per day in Iowa in foster group care. Oh, it was around 630, I guess, because we purchased just a few more beds than we had been using just because in Iowa, June knows we do everything with suspenders and belts. So we purchased a few more beds than we had been using. Our actual utilization for this fiscal year since the new contract started is about 520 kids per day. So we way over purchased. And while the, the um, projections were solid, some of this movement, both in keeping kids closer to home and in really looking at foster care placements to ensure that they were necessary group care placements, we made a pretty dramatic shift. We're, we're just now ending our first year of this contract, and we went from an average daily utilization of somewhere around 600 kids to, to about 520, so a big reduction. Uh, I put in here that the community response has been somewhat mixed, especially around the delinquent kids. So when we decided that we were going to place kids closer to home, for example, um, one of my first conversations with legislators when our session started in January of 2018, so the contracts have been in place about six months, one of the first conversations I had with a legislator was someone who came up to me and said, what the hell? I heard you're in charge of this. We just got rid of this little kid and now he's back in the community. What the hell? What the hell? So the conversation about why we want to keep kids closer to their homes has been kind of intriguing, especially as it relates to delinquent kids and the idea of community safety. But we're moving along and kind of chipping away at it. Um, 
the providers are uh, on the foster group care side have less of an ability to mix and match their kids, uh, both that they accept and that they end up ejecting, which is um, a bit of a challenge for us, frankly. I think providers always had the ability to keep a mix of kids that were, you know, a percentage of them that were almost ready to leave, a percentage that was kind of in the middle of their treatment, and a percentage of kids that were coming in. We, through that no eject, no reject, policy have changed their ability to do that. So we're continuing to talk about that. The interconnectedness of our contracts, very clear to the providers. So for, I'll just give you a real brief example. Our foster group care providers have a length of stay performance measure. They have become acutely aware that if the recruitment and retention folks do not have appropriate foster homes for them to step kids down into, or if our family-centered folks don't have their work done as it relates to getting families ready to take these kids back, their performance measures are suffering. The same thing is true for each of our contracts now. They are interdependent and they are reliant on each other to think more broadly than their own existence and to think about the service array as it exists for our kids and how they work together to ensure that we're hitting the goals that we need to hit. So that's awesome. Um, the last thing I'd say is that we think we're heading in the right direction. We're about a year in. Um, we did a lot of work in terms of setting things up. Um, I would say as it relates to Families First, um, I had the opportunity in early May to attend a convening for Casey in Phoenix. During that convening, um, Dr. Chaheen and Dr. Sanders did a presentation on child welfare history and the need to shift our paradigm looking at the 21st century. What I would tell you about folk or about that is that I have stolen that presentation shamelessly. And in every discussion we're having, regardless of the audience, about families first we are starting with the history of child welfare because if we, I would maintain to you that our child welfare system today is working as, exactly as it was designed to work through history and that it is fundamentally flawed. So to the extent that we all agree that this bill provides us one of the best opportunities in a generation to shift our thinking and to do the things that we know we need to do. If we start down the path of families first without at, at first blush grounding ourselves in the history that has brought us here, I will, I will tell you that I don't believe we will make progress because if we do the things that we have continued to do through time, we will continue to be where we are today, 10 years from now. So. Um, so I, I would tell you that presentation is huge. Iowa is on the path. We're doing, we've done presentations with our legislative staff, with all of our contractors and certainly internally are about to take that training on the road. Um, so we're, I, we're excited and terrified all at the same time, but we'll continue moving forward. Thank you so much, Wendy, for the presentation and that wonderful wrap up. You did it better than I could. So. Now we'd like to take some time for some questions that have come in, and if you have questions, feel free to submit them now, but we'll have Angie raise some of those that have already come in on the platform. Angie? Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so we've gotten a few questions. One, Carl, is for you um, regarding Virginia. So Chris was asking, um, he's curious about the community-based services and what those look like, and um, what is the service array looking like, and how are they best serving the families to help address safety risk factors at the same time as addressing substance use and mental health? So I can repeat that, Carl, if you need that. Uh, well, that's a broad question. So uh, there are uh, th there are a couple of places I would, uh, I'll tell you about it and then I will direct you to look at the link that is in the presentation for the Children's Services Act. Uh, when you go to that website, there's something called the Service Feed Directory. In, in the Service Feed Directory, 
that is a listing of all the different types of services, the providers that we use, and how, the types of services that they cover that are funded through the Children's Services Act. So uh, there has been a, a huge focus when we're talking about community-based services, we're talking really about wraparound services, not only to address the child's issues, but to address the familial issues. And so very much a two-generation type approach to services. So that service array will include everything from um, something similar to Healthy Families, which is one of our uh, evidence-based home visiting programs, uh, all the way through uh, something that we call virtual residential, to where um, you actually have pretty much somebody live, staying in the home with the child on a 24-7 basis instead of removing that child from the home. So your continuum runs from a prevention standpoint all the way up to uh, intensive supports or wrap around serving those children. The substance abuse one is uh, the one that's a proving harder for us to address. Uh, one of the main reasons being is that substance abuse looks so different across our state, depending on where you're, where you're at there. Certainly the opioids are a big driver, but so is methamphetamine, so is heroin. Uh, heroin is laced with fentanyl and carfentanil. We have PCP that is coming out. I don't know if I mentioned methamphetamines in that. And so uh, the, different, uh, the different types of treatments that we are partnering with our behavioral health, uh, our community service boards, which do that type of treatment, uh, will vary depending on which part of the state you're in. And we have some pretty significant gaps. So we don't have geographical saturation throughout the state with those uh, those services, but that is everything that uh, kind of focuses on the substance abuse realm. And then even further, we've been moving in the direction with our juvenile justice population to doing things uh, two primary evidence-based treatments: family functional therapy and multi-systemic therapy. And in addition to that, uh, trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. So those are some of the service array that we work on. Thanks, Carl. Chris, if you have additional questions, feel free to um, ask more and just send them to us and we can pass them along to Carl. Um, Sarah, one question a lot of folks are asking is about um, the slide deck and if we will send out the presentation as well as the recording. Um, so I just wanted to verify that that's something we can do after the webinar is over. Yes, absolutely. After this, you can be on the lookout for a follow-up email that'll have the recording, the PowerPoint, and then all of the different resources that our presenters have mentioned. And then if there's additional questions that we didn't cover today, we'll also include um, answers or responses in that packet as well. Yes. Um, one question from Melissa Ward um, asking if we have the link to the comments and ideas that HHS released. So, Angie, this is Joan. Yes, we, we can send out a link for the, it's the notice, the federal notice, and um, uh, we have a couple uh, things that we can get out right after this call to everyone that's been, um, that we sent the call notice to, to make sure that they have the, the request for comments from the federal um, administration on that. That's Perfect. great. Thanks, Thanks Joan. Joan. Yeah, and we have the link also embedded um, in the PowerPoint as well, so you can get it that way as well. So we'll try to send you all of that in one packet. Um, another question we received was if states will have the option or any options on placing in family-based residential models, so live-in house parents or only treatment programs. So I, is, I don't know if Christina is still on um, the webinar, because I would defer to her first to answer that question, or Drew, but I can answer it if neither one of them are still on. Yep, so this is Drew, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I think I think the question is uh, highlighting the issue of professional foster parents, um, and so I think that, um, or and or therapeutic foster parents, and so I, I think the issue is, um, so if it is, designed to have multiple children in the home, the rules around um, uh, the QRTP applying to kit, any placement where there are more than six children still applies, right? But if there are fewer than six children, I think um, 
it's, it's up to states how they are going to figure out um, whether that um, therapeutic foster home or, or, or professional foster home um, is, is needed to meet the unique needs of the child. So, um, you know, this is something we, we often try to remind states is that ultimately um, states have discretion in deciding what kind of placement um, they make based on the needs of the children in their system. Um, and, the, and the new rules in Family First is really designed to um, identify when federal reimbursement is available um, for group settings where there are more than six children. That's great. Thanks so much, Ju. Well, that's all the time we have allotted for today. We want to thank everyone for such a great turnout and conversation and presentation. As I said, you can expect an email follow-up from us um, with all of those resources and the recording and the PowerPoint. Um, we're just really glad that you could join us today, and we're looking forward to connecting with you on future webinar sessions and in other events as well. Thanks again to our presenters and for all of you for spending this hour with us. Take good care.